When you're looking for a biological virus, you use a microscope or some other laboratory device to try and identify the virus. But when you're looking for a computer virus, it's even more difficult because you can't see it at all. It's hidden in some piece of software or perhaps already buried in your operating system. Today, we take a look at computer viruses, their cure and prevention on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and Bix serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee, and this is Gary Kildall. Gary, you know, in the old days when some disease went through the country, the medicine man went from town to town selling his snake oil. Now that computer viruses are spreading throughout the country, the software houses are coming up with their snake oil. Dozens of antivirus programs like Vaccine, Immunize, Disc Watcher, Data Physician, Mason, on and on and on. Gary, there's a kind of folklore developing around the guys who create these computer viruses. Do you have to be a programming genius to create one? Well, Stuart, not really. There's really two issues, the creation of the virus program itself and getting it installed. Uh, the simplest case, a virus program would just find the beginning point of a program and, and jump to a little piece of code that's been patched in, and if it's the right day, then it zeroes your disk out, mm -hmm. and otherwise it just passes the control back to the program. Mm -hmm. uh, breaking into a bulletin board isn't very difficult because most of those bulletin boards are based on PCs, and they weren't, they weren't built to have their protection in the first mm -hmm. place. Going uh, breaking into a mini-computer mainframe is more difficult, obviously. But nice, it would be nice to see some of these efforts uh, going into virus programs, put into programs that are really useful for the industry instead. You know? <laughs> Gary, today we're going to take a look at computer viruses. We'll find out how they infect your system. We'll give you advice on how to prevent them, and if it's too late, how to locate and destroy viruses. We're going to begin today by visiting NASA's Ames Research Center at Moffett Field, California, to find out how they dealt with that massive computer virus that attacked over 6,000 systems on the ARPANET network last November. NASA's Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California, is best known for its contributions to planetary exploration and advanced aircraft designs. But recently, Ames became the latest victim of a computer virus, a damaging piece of code released into its computer network through a gateway, in this case, electronic mail. The viral intruder was discovered and removed by the Ames Computer Network Architect in collaboration with the University of California. The virus is not hard to find if you know where to look. If you look here, this ARSH attempt, that is attempting to open up a connection and break in to a remote machine. In this case, the machine's name is Wilbur. Um, here, the virus is also, another copy of the virus, is attacking a machine uh, on the East Coast at Langley Research Center. Um, and here is actually the virus going through this user UCB Netstat. He's looking through the routing table to attack other machines that, are, uh, that forward messages from, from this machine to other machines on the network. Although no data files were lost nor system files damaged, Ames spent about $70,000 to find and destroy the self-replicating virus. Since then, NASA's major California research center has taken steps to keep the intruder out. We install the protections that we had devised very early in the process on all of our systems, put them under test against a known copy of the virus, and let it bang against those systems for a period of time to ensure that they wouldn't be reinfected. The vulnerability of an open network is not unique to Ames, but the problem of providing information to a wide group of people without exposing the data to viral pranks is not easily solved. The more protections you put on the system, the less user-friendly they become, and it's always a trade-off between the reasonableness of the protections and how they uh, affect
Hudson. John is director of PC Labs, a division of PC Magazine, and next to John, Andrew Siebold, a member of the board of the National Land Labs and publisher of Outlook on Professional Computing. Gary? Andy, um, how, how do viruses manifest themselves and what, what do they do? Well, first of all, they, they attack your computer programs and, and they corrupt them, and they can corrupt them in a lot of varying ways. There are some viruses that are quote unquote benign and they get in and they just flash up on the screen, gotcha, hello. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, the viruses that everybody concerned about today are the ones that get in and they manipulate your data, they corrupt your programs, and they make changes that you're not aware of and that you don't know and you don't have any control over. Uh, they can go so far as to actually change data in an accounting file, they can change a word processing file, and they can multiply themselves from one application to another application, pretty soon taking over your entire hard disk so none of your programs will run or operate properly. Before you even get to know that. That's right, yeah. before you even know they're there. What's the motivation behind uh, people that do these, these things? You got any idea, John? It, um, it, it baffles me. I mean, there are there is potential for criminal intent, of course, mm -hmm. there always has been, but it seems to me that the viruses that have been coming on so far have been nothing much more than malicious mischief. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, there's also, you heard about uh, worms and viruses and Trojan horse and so forth. What are the differences between these uh, kinds of programs? Well, let's see. A virus will actually corrupt programs to the extent that they can in turn corrupt other programs. So they will work on executable files, mm -hmm. they will install themselves inside the executable file, much as a, a real human virus installs itself inside mm -hmm. of you, and then you can in turn infect me. Um, a worm is, pr is usually a program that just duplicates itself and makes copies of itself all over the place. And a Trojan horse is one that has a program that's damaging inside an otherwise innocent looking program. Mm -hmm. Now you have an example here of a virus, which you're going to show us what a virus does right. to your hard disk in this case, and then a program, a vaccine program to counterattack it. Right. Would you run through the virus first for us? Okay, let's, let's also just for starters say that this is a, an extremely dumb and innocent virus. Okay. It's one that would not um, probably present itself to you. Viruses tend to be very quiet in their operation. This one's very noisy so that number one so we can demonstrate. Just for demo purposes. Okay. Okay. Just for demo purposes. A dumb demo virus. A dumb demo, <laughs> a dumb demo okay. virus. This is a clean directory on a, on a PC and uh, all these programs are perfectly good. If I was to run WordStar for example and here it is and it's fine, it's just great, no okay. problem at all. So I'll leave WordStar and um, then I'll run this virus program. So you're going to load the virus. I'm going to call virus up and say, hello, be virus. And he says, all com files on this disk will be infected, which no self-respecting <laughs> virus would do. And you are warned, ha ha, and so on. So now, we know we now have an infected situation. We know it. And in fact, if I was careful and I was looking at my disk in this case, I would find out that these programs are infected. But again, a self-respecting virus wouldn't even go and change the directory. You would yeah. not even know it was there. So for example, you see different dates and if you're really careful, different file sizes in exactly. some of those files. Exactly. Now, different file sizes would be hard to do without, but it's also something the user doesn't check very sure. often. <clears throat> so now if I run WordStar, uh, we're going to find out that our virus is in fact there. And um, he came by and, and ran his ran his thing. The uh -huh. message there told us that it was installed. Yeah, it, was, it was there. And if I come back and execute, uh, if I leave the system, uh, it will be there. If I go to another directory and run WordStar, mm -hmm. um, where it's been copied to in this, its damaged condition, it announces that it's there. And when I leave here, all okay, well it's the, gone and, and changed and all, changed the all files. these files. Okay. Mm -hmm. and it's, yeah. and it's okay. so, so in other words, the, the copy of WordStar now carries the infection with it yes, to potentially the next user who might have taken that copy. So if I take this copy of WordStar and I give it to you, Stuart, and you take it home and put it on your PC, right. it's going to start infecting files in any directory that you operated on in your PC or any disk. Okay, now you have a, a FluShot Plus pro program now that's uh, right. supposed to detect some of these things. Right. <laughs> FluShot Plus will detect um, programs that are working at the software level on, um, on your programs and will be able to detect this virus if I run it. Okay. Okay, let's put it back. Okay. And now if I run WordStar in this directory where again the corrupt mm -hmm. version of WordStar has been installed, here it is, we'll run it and FluShot comes up and says, here's this program, it's trying to mess with your files. Now what okay. does mess with your files mean is it's working on the uh, written copies of your files. It's modifying the files on your disk. So the first thing FluShot did was find that there was a virus in your system right. by warning you. Okay, what happens next? Now it says to me it's trying to modify all these files and FluShot gives you the ability to go ahead and let the program modify files and the reason that it has to do that is that any self-respecting ordinary application program in order to do its work will be out working on your data files all the time otherwise it's not doing very much for you at all. Mm -hmm. So in this case to let the program go, I'll just let it go and ruin all my files. And when I leave WordStar, it will be all the files. Now that's, that's detecting the uh, virus through um, 
preventing a right operation of the disc. Now, there are other ways in which the virus can operate, though, right? That is so correct. get around that. Uh, that is correct. You can, you can write a program that goes in at the hardware level and controls your hardware and doesn't let the operating system know what's actually going on. Flu shot and programs like it depend on uh, viruses being, let's say, well behaved. They actually go in through software facilities that are available on the PC and modify your files. So just because you have a vaccine type program like a flu shot plus doesn't mean you're protected from viruses. Right. It means you're protected from relatively what I would call relatively minor viruses. And, and in fact, tell us about the original flu shot. Well, the original <laughs> flu shot was, in fact, corrupted by a virus. And that's why there's a flu shot plus. That's correct. <laughs> okay. And, uh, Andy, uh, real quick, what is it, where, where would uh, you be in danger of getting a virus in your well, system? Yeah, you know, if you have a standalone or? system and you're buying all off-the-shelf uh, software from known vendors and you don't exchange disks with people and you don't talk on bulletin board systems through modems and things like that, chances are you're pretty safe, right? Mm -hmm. But if somebody brings a disk over and you exchange it, uh, if you call a bulletin board and you download some programs that are available, or if somebody says, hey, take my WordStar file even, right, mm -hmm. and bring it up on your system and work on it, viruses can be transmitted that way. You just can't tell. So you have to be real careful. If you're attached to a network, it complicates the problem dramatically because you don't know where on the network a virus can get interjected and what it will do on a network. Okay, John, Andy, we're going to ask both of you to come back a little bit later in the program, and we want to talk about safe computing practices. Also, in just a minute, we'll take a look at some vaccine programs for the Macintosh. First of all, a visit to a small business that was infected by a computer virus to find out what they did about it. Wendy Woods reports from Santa Clara, California. The idea seemed harmless enough. Susan would take home a data disk to continue her work on her home computer. Little did she know the next morning that same innocent looking disc was coming back to work infected with a data killing virus. The virus would come to be called by the name of the day it struck, Friday the 13th. I thought I had a, a hard disc crash at first, but after I um, delved into it a little bit, I found that the disc was fine, mechanically it was fine, but there was no software in there. The, uh, the boot tracks were gone, the system tracks were gone, the uh, file allocation table was gone. It was just scrambled, it was still there. And the root directory was just absolutely trashed. The virus, which came from a game on Susan's home computer, ultimately forced Jim to wipe his hard disk clean. And while he hasn't gotten rid of it completely, he has the virus under control, thanks to a program called okay. Tracer, which blocks the virus from doing damage. Jim was lucky, though. All the hard disk data, records he keeps for his precious metals lab, had been backed up. I consider myself very, very fortunate that I, that I forced myself, even when I just didn't want to, to back everything up. Because the virus in here is so insidious, hard disk backup is no longer optional for this small business. In fact, as Jim Mount said, if he hadn't backed up his files, that virus might have put him out of business. In Santa Clara, California, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy. Software, the makers of Virex. Next to Robert is Jack McDonald, president of Magna, the makers of Empower Security Software for the Macintosh. Gary? Jack, one of the things that's happened in our personal computer industry in general is there really hasn't been any access control. You know, you start your computer system up and put disks in it. And, uh, and the second issue that we're talking about, the creation of the virus is the first one, and the access to the computer system is the second one. Uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, control of access. Well, you know, as you stated, there, there really hasn't ever been any security on, on Macintoshes especially. It's just there's no, no security to breach, so therefore it's really easy to get in. Therefore, a virus-type program can uh, go in and attack any program on any hard disk, any floppy. And with an access control program such as Empower, you can limit uh, who can make changes to your programs and therefore prohibit viruses from attaching themselves to, mm -hmm. to any program. All right, you've got another approach, Robert, which is Virex, and let me ask you, it's not quite a vaccine program, is it? How would you describe Virex? Well, it's a very complementary approach to the security uh, awareness product that Magna markets. Uh, it's a, a class three product, and that means what it does is detect known computer viruses, and if a virus is present, it gives you the ability to eliminate the virus by 
wiping out the virus and restoring infected files to their pre-infected state. Mm -hmm. well, the key word there is that they're known viruses, right? You That's have to correct. You go in there and look for patterns and so forth that those particular viruses would create. That's right. Mm -hmm. We're looking for known viruses, and if and when new, known, uh, new viruses occur, we plan to update the product with the ability to detect and combat those viruses. Well, what does that mean, a known virus? Uh, one that has been uh, diagnosed as being a virus with known characteristics and one that we are aware of. Uh, in this industry, there's a, a lot of hysteria about viruses and there are reports every day about possible new viruses and most of those are, are typically not computer viruses. They're just uh, other phenomena, other problems that, that mm -hmm. arise. Could you give us a demonstration of Virex and show us how it would work on the Mac? Certainly. And just give us kind of play-by-play -play as you go here, Robert. What Basically, happened? we remind uh, uh, users, uh, we give them an important word about computer viruses, and we remind them that we combat only known computer viruses. Mm -hmm. We also emphasize the importance of backing up software, uh, because we think that in addition to using a product like this, it's very important to have uh, you know, good backup procedures uh, uh, to use reliable and mm -hmm. reputable mm -hmm. uh, software. Okay, so you have Virex up now on the Mac. That's right. And when it comes up, uh, it has a help screen uh, that provides online help to the user uh, uh, and providing very useful operating instructions. And basically, in this part of the screen, we have uh, three action items, uh, icons, that enable you to diagnose, uh, repair, and to get online okay, help. So where's the virus right now in this system? You're going to put one in there? Well, in this case, Virex shows you the diskettes that, are, uh, that it can see that are loaded into the system. Mm -hmm. and uh, we toggle uh, icons on and off to activate them. This diskette here has uh, programs on it that are infected with the okay. SCORES virus. And we can diagnose that diskette by clicking on one icon. Again, uh -huh. this is designed not you know, to be an extremely easy program to use, point and click uh, type of interface. Okay, so we now, it's What's just it telling, us? telling us that we have a, the SCORES virus in the second drive. That's right, drive, it right? tells you infections were detected, mm -hmm. consult the above listing, and what it does is it tells you the diskette, the file, mm -hmm. uh, and the actual program that's infected. Okay, Rob, you can now repair that disk? That's right. Okay. Uh, let me demonstrate that. We repair the disk by clicking on one icon. And what is it doing then when it's repairing the disk? Right now what it's doing uh, is it's, is it's, uh, it's re-examining the disk uh, uh, for infections and then it gives you the option file by file to repair them and to restore them to the original state. Now we're able to do that because we know the exact characteristics of these viruses. We know exactly how they alter programs mm -hmm. and as a result we know exactly how to repair the files uh, and to undo the damage that was done by the, the viral infection. And so it's completed now and you have removed the virus from that one floppy disk. That's right. And if we were to re-examine that, uh, for example, we'll see that... Uh, so you uh, can do that diagnose again to see if it's clean? Right. And if you did that, you'd find that the, uh -huh. the diskette was clean. Okay. I'm going to ask you if you can slide the keyboard over there to Jack and get out of Virex so we can take a look at this uh, other approach here, Jack. Uh, while Robert is doing that, uh, tell us about, you have a program called Empower, which talks about, uh, which deals with security, as you and Gary were talking about before. What exactly does it do? Empower is a full-featured access control and automatic data encryption product for the Macintosh. We have ability to use multiple users and multiple groups on on, uh, on the Macintosh, uh -huh. and also at the same time doing transparent data encryption to, to really ensure that data is protected. Okay, and, and from a virus point of view now, is this, having this kind of security system protection against a virus? Yes, you can use, you can use Empower to help prevent the spread of viruses. It's, it's a prevention mechanism. You can lock up all of your, for instance, let's go into all the really important data files and so forth. Really important up. data files. You can, you can put them into folders that, that you don't okay. give anybody right access okay. to. So you're into the program and, and show us how it works. All right. This is the, just a normal Macintosh desktop, just like everybody is used to seeing. The thing that we've added since Empower has been added to this system is we are in the background protecting who can access what privileges, okay. what things. So, for instance, I've got a, a folder here that contains all of Apple's uh, programs. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that with Empower installed, there's an extra 
a little pencil with this flash through it, which means that, no, that nobody has right access to this, this folder, to these programs, so no virus can go out and attach themselves to that. So in other words, if some other user came in and worked on my Mac, uh -huh. they couldn't access and write to those files. Sure, they, they could still use the programs, uh -huh. which you might want them to go ahead and do, but then they couldn't modify those programs. You have various layers of security? That's correct. Uh, for, for each, uh, uh, let's see here. Okay. Yeah, for each for each uh, folder, we can have there's there's three things you can specify. You can have specify to the C folders, the C files, mm -hmm. to make changes. You can also specify which groups are so uh, are doing. Uh -huh. that. Uh, let's bring up one that has a no privilege set. Here's one. So we just do a get privileges here in order to set privileges on this, uh -huh. on this folder. And you see that it's not signed to anybody currently and that everybody has complete access rights to, to everything in that folder. So you could have different privileges attached to different folders that is inside correct. the system. Each folder would have their own privileges specified. Now, Jack, does this prevent uh, the hardware level uh, corruption of the disk? No, this right? is a purely software mm -hmm. technique that okay, we're so using. So it's assuming that the virus is going through the operating system to make the various calls That's and correct. things of that sort. Another real nice feature we have for viruses is the ability to disable the floppy drives where you can specify that the floppy drive should never be used. So mm -hmm. you boot, your, boot up your machine with your hard disk and nobody can insert a floppy disk that may be contaminated. Uh -huh. and okay, so this protects you from outsiders. It doesn't really protect you from yourself, though, if you bring in a corrupted piece of software. That's uh, correct. Yeah. If, if you have right access to anything, then the, the virus program could be able to attach to it. Gentlemen, thank you very much. In just a minute, we're going to have some advice for you on safe computing practices to help you avoid the problem of viruses. Stay Seabold of Outlook. Gary? Andy, uh, you work with LAN Labs. You come up with a, a set of rules or guidelines to abide by for uh, safe computing practices. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, well, the, the National LAN Lab is a nonprofit organization, first okay. of all, and there are a number of vendors in the community who are involved in supporting the operation. And the set of guidelines that they came up with for quote unquote safe computing are things that make sense. You know, you don't put a piece of software on your machine if you don't know the origin of it. You don't swap software with people. You don't, if you call a bulletin board, you have to be very careful. You have to know the bulletin board. You have to know who runs it. You have to be very careful of the types of programs that you download. Um, basically, you need to know the origin of every program that comes into your system. You need to know the origin of every file that comes into your system. Who has access to your computer? There's security issues as far as when you're not near your computer, who can get on it, how it's connected to a network, how it's connected to mainframes and uh, other computers which are external. The uh, the recent Arbornet thing is a is a good indication of what can happen. I mean, it just takes off like wildfire. And basically, it's all common sense. There are some very, very important things. You have to back up your files, and you have to back up your programs and your system files, and you have to be very religious about that. You have to have a set of known good programs because the only cure, if you have a virus that infects your system, you're going to have to dump it. You're going to have to lose all your data. Then you have to bring it back up and reformat it, and then you're going to have to reinstall your programs. And at the point of reinstallation, you're going to have to check the ones that you're reinstalling to make sure you don't duplicate the problem again. Well, and, uh, well, John, I, I, actually, this would be a good question for you: is uh, how effective are these uh, antivirus programs, like uh, no, the offshoots of uh, yeah. uh, flu shots, and so forth? At some level, they're effective. I mean, to the extent that viruses are well behaved, they're effective, um, at least in the PC environment. It's it's perfectly legitimate to write a virus that legitimate that's the wrong word. <laughs> to, write, to write a virus that works at a software level and, and corrupts files that way but it's also not difficult to write one that works down at the hardware level and is below the level that a virus protection the vaccine program can detect John are any of these so-called vaccine software programs uh, effectively essentially useless I mean they don't really do anything well, useless is a little bit of a strong word. Uh -huh. I think that there's, there's some measure of protection that you can get, but I, what I'm concerned is, is that people will get a false sense of security yeah. and think they're protected against everything. Yeah, Andy, I wanted to ask you about that, because I know the LAN labs did not endorse any vaccine software, and I was wondering why. Well, there were two reasons. Number one is some of the members of the LAN lab felt that there was a potential here for somebody to interject a virus into the com computer community and then make money by actually coming out with mm, a vaccine. All right? mm. So they were concerned about that. The other is that there are so many different types of virus, there are so many different types of, of games that programmers can play that to endorse that type of thing 
there, there isn't one yeah. that does it all. Finally, in the PC lab study, did you come up with any particular vaccine programs that, you, that the magazine's recommending? Nope, we're going to do another one pretty soon. Take a look. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. That's our look at computer viruses. We'll be back in just a minute with this week's computer news. DigiPro has announced a new form of non-volatile storage, which it calls the flash disk. It essentially uses EEPROM technology to electronically erase and reprogram the memory on a chip. DigiPro says that the flash disk chips can be reprogrammed within the system by an end user. And flash disk comes on an add-in board and is based on Intel CMOS flash memory technology. DigiPro says the flash disk supports MS-DOS and the VAX environment and both 16 and 32-bit architectures. DigiPro sees the initial market as laptop computers and CAD systems. A 5 megabyte version is due out in the first quarter of the year with a 300 megabyte flash disk promised later in the year. Microsoft has announced another delay in the release of Word 4.0 for the Macintosh. The company says the delay is due to continuing efforts at optimizing the speed and memory requirements of the program. Microsoft says Word 4.0 should be out by the end of February. Meanwhile, Forbes magazine says Microsoft is among the 10 most profitable companies in the country. It came in six and was the only computer company in the top 10. The only other computer company in the top 25 was Sun Microsystems. The Software Publishers Association has gotten into the Atari Nintendo battle. The SPA has publicly criticized Nintendo for attempting to control the game cartridge market for Nintendo game consoles. Nintendo machines will only read a cartridge that includes a proprietary Nintendo chip. Atari is suing Nintendo for restraint of trade and says it has found a way to duplicate the Nintendo chip. The SPA says the Nintendo practice sets a dangerous precedent for computer software. Sony says it wants a piece of the resurging video and computer game business. It has announced the formation of a new division to write and market video and game software. The wholly owned subsidiary is called CGS ImageSoft. Sony is projecting first year sales of $8 million. The Army is playing its own video games these days with a massive real-time simulation of Star Wars, or SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. The Army's war game involves a Cray XMP supercomputer connected to eight mini supercomputers connected to 30 mainframes. The Army says the experiment will enable them to synchronize all Earth and space-based SDI assets within four microseconds. Finally, there's a new kind of PC fax board, the anti-junk fax PC board. The complete PC says its new CFAX 9600 board allows the user to screen an incoming fax on the computer display before it gets printed. So if it is junk fax mail, you can dump it, clear the line, and save on paper. That's it for this week's Random Access. I'm Cynthia Steele. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte magazine and BIX, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and BIX serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.